Okay, so uh, this session is um, on the evolution of uh, emul emulators <laughs> uh, from monolithic to uh, web microservices. Uh, your presenters today are Deepak and Padal, and um, this is session 3F. So please, on completion, will you fill in your uh, feedback? That would be appreciated. And um, off we go. Over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Badal here, Senior Technical Architect for HCL. Uh, the product, what I present is IBM HackP and Hats. And with me, it's Deepak Bohra. He is Senior Technical manager uh, from ICL and the product base is same IBM Hack and Hats. And uh, today we are going to talk about emulators uh, which are available to access the mainframes and what kind of technologies uh, these uses and how emulators uh, are ad adapting to our uh, rapidly changing demands, right? So that's we are going to look into. And majorly we will see how the emulator which comes with IBM Hack and Hats uh, try to resolve all those kind of requirements whatever customers has. So that's the agenda for today. Uh, we'll start with the emulators, uh, what these are and what the expectations uh, from our customer or end user has been. We will then cover IBM personal communications or PCOM if you would have used it earlier. So it's a Windows based uh, platform, uh, the application. Then we will talk about some Java based application or the emulators, uh, which are hard and then HEC PEE, wherein Java is kind of not required at all. And then we will touch base on the future strategy of the emulators, what it could be uh, when we're looking for the future growth or the ongoing demand of our IT environment and the end users. Uh, we have the slide for questions at end, but please feel free to ask it in between if you have any. Yeah. So uh, let's start uh, with just talking about the emulators first. I think the mainframes, uh, we all are aware that it's it's been since 1952 or around that time. And obviously we need something uh, to access the data what we have into the mainframe, right? So. Uh, and it's obviously, uh, we cannot just stand on the rack system and then try to look into the data. The end user needs something uh, which is nothing but an emulator to access this remotely. There could be a different means of uh, doing that, uh, but mostly it is about accessing the data and the program what has been written via the emulators. Now, as the technology is changing up since then, because uh, I remember PCOM used to be, it's it's one of the oldest players in the, in the emulator space uh, around 90 of 84, around that time it was there, I believe. So earlier it used to be called as my TE. So since then a lot of things has changed and that landscape is evolving. So we need to see actually how the emulator themselves are trying to adapt to run all those critical applications, what do you have into the mainframe? <clears throat> And every end user uh, uses uh, these kind of terminal emulator in their uh, own way, right? So uh, from IBM Hackby, uh, there are this package, what I'm talking about, it's host access client package. It consists of uh, nearly three products, which is PCOM, personal communication, and then we have host on demand, hot, and then uh, host access client package, extended edition Hackby EE, which is uh, without the Java dependency. And we'll go through into those also. And meanwhile, while exploring those, we'll try to understand and dive into understanding some fact that how we access uh, our these systems, right? And how we can modernize it for our critical based application in our mainframe, what we have it. And uh, the risk is something which you want to minimize at own cost. Now, uh, before further, uh, we do have emulator, we access it anyway, that exists, uh, that's a fact. But there are more expectations from our end user and, and those are the valid expectations, which is always required due to our due to the requirement uh, of the automation which we need or how much actually we can export the emulator in itself. So for example, the 64-bit uh, multi-platform environment. Now we had, I think, 16-bit PCOM, I remember, then 32-bit was there. Now 64-bit uh, applications uh, has to be there because uh, most of our laptops or desktops are into the 64-bit environment. And we want to make use of that kind of framework so that our application can make use of it, right? So nice UI, UX experience also has been modified in 64-bit. And further, that architecture also helps us to make our applications, what we write in 64-bit, to process a bit faster. 
so that support is required and and one more thing everybody asks for is that when we are migrating from 32 bit to 64 bit how seamless that migration could be then the integration with our desktop productivity tools. Uh, most of our end user, for example, let's say we are talking about uh, the finance sector, then uh, the use case has been like doing some screen scraping of the data from the emulator screen, and then taking that data onto Excel, and then doing some kind of calculation on top of it, right? We cannot expect our users to every day go into the screen and then uh, do a copy paste from there. So for that, uh, there are some uh, applications like in Excel, for example, you can write a VBA code and achieve the automation. So that is something you want to integrate uh, with the emulator so that uh, you don't have to actually go into emulator, log in every day, then get the data out of it, make it all kind of API based within the Excel, for example. Then the APIs are something uh, we also needed. Now we, again, we cannot expect our user to every day go into do the mundane job, right? So seamlessly, let's say I want to extract the customer information. So I will log in to my mainframe system, then go to a main menu and then some customer info page, then I will provide the ID and then hit and enter. And the data could be number of pages left and right or uh, page down or at the bottom of it. So. Uh, what if there exists some kind of API which allows to automate all this process, let's say from login, extracting the data, taking the input uh, from the user, and then taking that data from mainframe and pasting it to somewhere which application we need, for example, Excel, which we talked about. So for that emulator need to have a powerful API. And even if they have the API, it should be kind of evolving, right? Uh, you should have the people who must be actually making sure that API is always robust and with the on-demand, with our demands coming in from customer that, okay, some change in the API, that should be achievable. Now, uh, applications are there, uh, multi-platform you need it, then Java will be there probably. Right, so uh, if you have emulator which are based on Java, so then the demand came that you want to reduce the Java dependency. The reason could be uh, many, like the security sometimes. So if some patches has to be uh, done on a Java, so you have to upgrade the Java version. Now it's kind of an uh, different uh, application if we compare to the emulator. The emulator needs, there's a dependency with the Java, it becomes over here. So you want to reduce the dependency, not to go into the complexity of upgrading the Java, ensuring that everybody has the correct patch being applied. So that's one of the expectation is there. Now, the uh, emulator at the end is a software, right? So nowadays we go to, we, we very much share the distributed environment. So we want our emulator also to behave in the same kind of thing. At least the default configuration or the configuration, which is very much common to our multiple users or a group of set of users that can be, if that can be shared among them, how it is possible. So that kind of thing we wanted. The administration uh, of the emulator. So, so we want to ensure that set of people are able to access, for example, a given uh, workstation, sorry, uh, the given emulator session or, or the host session from it. So that kind of administration we want to have. We want to ensure that the user sees uh, probably the right amount of toolbar or they, are, they can actually run a macro or not. So that kind of administration we want to have it. So that's one of the uh, expectations we have it and then uh, monitoring the usage uh, that's for the compliance right so how many people are actually end users are making use of the emulator what we have it because let's say audit is happening so you need to know about that the license has not been breached or not so that's an IT thing which which you always want to have it and last but not the least that the security mainframe and we know anyway that it's one of the secured system what we have but still we are accessing it via emulator. So that communication also should be secured and it should be up to the standards uh, which are there right now into the industry. So these are the common expectations and, and obviously the expectations will rise depending on what we, our demand as a goal in the industry is or my company has uh, with the emulator. So that will rise in, but these are some kind of a common expectation which most of our end user always have it. So, Let's let's see the journey actually. What we have uh, since the evolution of um, the, this technology, the emulator, and how these emulator were being able to cater to all these demands, and still these are evolving, right? So uh, let's start with the personal communication. It was a Windows. It's a Windows-based uh, emulator. So everybody will have an EXE. It will be installed over there, and then you start the EXE, connect to the host and done. So you will be there, you will have the screen. It's very fast, actually, pretty fast. It's a native code uh, and just uh, directly connect to the IBM binaries uh, with the mainframe, gets the data, display on the terminal. 
Now that was been used and that was running fine. Then came a requirement that for now the browser is very much common, right? With the advent of internet and having the browser very much commonly used wherein you can access anything from everywhere. So why not to have this kind of application which can be made available over the browser so that our user can use it from anywhere. That's where IBM Hot Host on Demand uh, comes into picture. You can call upon the session uh, profile okay, or via the URL. The terminal will be downloaded uh, as a Java client to a system and then you can access it. But there is a Java dependency over there and it was running fine. But till again, then we realized that, okay, we also can get the application without the Java dependency. And as actually the HTML also been progressed, right? It allowed uh, the applications to be embedded into it. And that's where one more opportunity was there. And we came with IBM Hack PEE. That's, uh, we also call it as a zero footprint uh, web-based solution, wherein there is no Java dependency, but you directly connect to the terminal emulator into the browser. So everything, accessing the data, just copy paste, running the macro, all those things works into Hack PEE as it, as it works in hard or as it works in an uh, IBM puzzle communication. So we will talk about uh, these emulator uh, one by one. And first we will uh, go into the personal communication. Then uh, I have Deepak with me. He will be talking about host on demand and hack PE afterwards. Yeah. So personal communications are actually uh, the traditional one, I would say. <laughs> this emulator has been uh, since very long. And uh, uh, with 327, or 5250. And now this application actually uh, supports both 32-bit and 64-bit uh, windows. And, and it is a Windows-based application. So now most of the customers or, or as an industry-wise, right, everybody's moving to 64-bit. So the application also is expected to be 64-bit now. And that's where personal communication also comes with 64-bit. And there is a reason the 64-bit also was been introduced. We'll just talk about those uh, as we pass through. Uh, PCOM comes with its own, uh, means it comes with the API actually, which is required, right? So all these APIs helps you to connect with, for example, an Excel sheet, you can write a code in VBA, automate the process, call upon the PCOM APIs, uh, multiple segregations are there, Hackle, then there is LAP code, PCS API. So those APIs are available uh, for the user to make use of. <clears throat> Then uh, about the security, um, there's an HTTPS uh, TLS 1.3. I will talk about what this HTTP is, what is it is doing actually into PCOM space right now. Uh, but the secure connection with Telnet is there. Uh, currently it supports 1.2. With HTTPS, it is 1.3. And let's look why actually it is uh, 1.3. Now, if in the architecture side, uh, if we see, uh, there is a browser, uh, sorry, there is a PCOM, what you have installed into the uh, system. And then it directly connects to the Telnet system. All right, so that's we have been using our traditional PCOM on this install, in install into the windows. Now we have a hack P server over here. So how does it help is PCOM uh, right now the version is 15, but uh, from PCOM version 14 onwards, we have come up with uh, one more innovative solutions with the PCOM space, with the Windows-based emulator space that it can be now made centralized, wherein some common configurations uh, or the user profile can be uploaded to the HackP server, uh, what we have. And in the server, all this profile decides, the session profile also resides into this server. And a user from the PCOM emulator actually can connect to these servers and then they can retrieve the, the WS file or the workstation profile of theirs and start working. So till now, when you were using PCOM, you were into your own system, you had your own workstation profile just working over there, right? And But now it has been made shareable, you can do it. There are some other properties files also, which we will have a look into in our next slide. So that allows us to make kind of a more centralized distribution with the PCOM space. Till now that was not possible since V14, it has been made available into PCOM. So that's where this HTTPS uh, TLS 1.3 comes in uh, because now we are connecting with the server and not the mainframe, but a HackP server, that server runs into a web server. HackP server runs into a web server. So you need to have an HTTP or HTTPS kind of connections happening to it. So currently TLS 1.3 was recently been updated to, to 1.3, early it was 1.2. <clears throat> 
Now, there are a lot of other functionalities uh, what the PCOM has. Uh, it's a dynamic configuration is available over there. You can customize the icon, the toolbar, you can do it. Uh, the keyboard function setup and mapping, that is also possible. We do have end-to-end -end security. Uh, it starts as TLS 1.2. If not, then fallbacks to 1.1 and 1.0. It make use of uh, MS Capi as a uh, as a provider. So your certificates, if you're using Windows, so MS Capi is a very common uh, key store over there. So it make use of that. It make use of its API to ensure that if we are talking uh, with our telnet session in a secure mode, then the service, uh, then the certificates are well available there. Then other things are like uh, log and trace facility. Uh, it provides uh, with the transport layer, you can uh, make sure the logging is there. That all helps actually at the debugging level at the support time. Uh, this is then the macro is one of the important part emulator should have and and obviously pcom also have as user can record the macros uh, we call it uh, dot mac files those are internally actually the vb scripts so you can record a macro uh, within pcom and then you can just uh, make the automation or possible for all the common tasks which you do in a regular way right extracting the data for example or going into a specific page so you can record a macro put that in the toolbar icon so whenever you come in every day if you are a or to run that task, just click on the button and it will do all the tasks for you. <clears throat> and then uh, the code pitch and the language support uh, that does exist. And uh, the API, uh, which I talked about uh, anyway. So LAPI, PCS API, and the Hackle is something uh, which it supports. And it's a very extensive support over there. We can write uh, an application into an Excel, a VBA application which will actually can start an emulator automatically. That emulator can be either uh, hidden uh, or in a minimized mode or in a restore mode it can be. And from there you can uh, extract the data uh, from your running this emulator, right? And even uh, with V15, we have an ActiveX support uh, with the 64 bit, 32 bit it was already there. So ActiveX support, how it helps is that it allows you to embed the terminal emulator into your program. In this case, for example, in Excel, you can actually make use of that OLE object and import that object, which is nothing but the PCOM emulator screen. So that screen will be visible inside the Excel sheet itself. If you want to, that's something uh, depending on what the use case is. So, but all for, for all those things, uh, all, all the support is still there. And that was all about the automation. Uh, I think we discussed about the online session manager there. Uh, for license uh, management, uh, we do have our own license manager, uh, uh, which takes care of our most of our HackP uh, usage. So we can see actually the number of license being consumed for the PCOM also. <coughs> Recently with PCOM V15, uh, we have come up with the support to the Azure Virtual Desktop. So uh, we, we know that nowadays everybody is trying to move to the cloud, right? So uh, if the PCOM also can be part of it as an emulator. So if you have uh, Azure Virtual Desktop, then you can have the PCOM as uh, the app being hosted over there. So you access it from anywhere, then that app will be available to you in your virtual desktop. So that is the ongoing support. And that is the kind of innovation which is happening into the PCOM space. I will uh, move to the next slide. So here in, we'll touch base onto this online session manager, which I talked about earlier, right? Uh, so we, we are saying that we have a centralized management, we have a HackP server over here. So what this thing is, we will just have a look into it. So uh, administrator now can manage uh, the upgradation of PCOM. Okay, so uh, that is one thing which it provides. So all the patches is something which you can, test fixes you can uh, keep into the HackP server. And whenever any update is there, then it will be prompted to the end user asking that if you want to uh, update uh, your PCOM or not. So those things are available. Now you have two, two uh, manager, one is the offline session manager and one is online. Both will be still available to the end user. If you have an HackP server uh, available, then uh, you can provide the information into the online session manager and it will be able to connect directly to the server. And you can either upload uh, your WS or the uh, workstation profile, okay, which will have all the information of the configuration which host you are connecting to. Uh, is it TLS support? It, you want to enable TLS over there or not? So all those things uh, will be available. Multiple instances of session manager, uh, which is offline, uh, can be invoked at a time. But this online is kind of uh, one will be available to you because it 
it is uh, one instance will be connecting to the HackP server. So for that purpose, there will be only one instance. Now, uh, what all things can be migrated to the HackP server? Uh, those will be the work session profile. Uh, that's as of now, and the development work is still going on into this uh, so that we can add more and more common kind of uh, configuration files. The session files, the batch files, the keyboard mapping, right? So some settings or the configuration per the emulator is available that can be, uh, these are the available that can be actually uploaded to the HackP server. So HackP server, uh, you'll probably get a more uh, detailed explanation when Deepak will take you through the HOD and HackP EE. It actually is the same server, which is which can be shared with the PCOM also, which can be shared with HOD and HackP EE. So uh, admin has the whole control now about uh, migrating, or sorry, the upgrading the client, and they also can create a group of uh, users over there. So, so that kind of administration is now made available into the Amulet space for the PCOM, which was not available earlier. And that gives a lot of flexibility now, right? Because uh, we are seeing a lot of users into our organizations and uh, we don't want it to be just uh, managing everything onto their own. We want somebody to have there. And most of our application in industry are kind of in distributed architecture. So therein it makes sense to have PCOM because there are a lot of settings which could be common to many of our groups. It could be in a geographical area wherein we want to share with them. So uh, that's about uh, the session manager, online session manager. That's a kind of a new functionalities uh, which we have into IBM PCOM. Anyway, that's all about uh, the emulator, uh, the Windows-based emulator. But there are still further opportunities into this one, right? Because uh, the demand will always change and user will have more requirement because now we are getting to see so many things, right? So what all further opportunities it could be, right? So we talked about the Windows-based personal communication. But what if we want to access the emulator in multiple platforms? Okay, my company probably has uh, not just Windows. They might have kind of a Linux system. They might have an Apple system. So, uh, and, and Windows probably, it's commonly distributed. So what about having an emulator which can be used anywhere? Mm -hmm. right? So we talked about the administration. It was kind of a glimpse of it, which the PCOM actually has added and it is adding more into that one. But we want to have more robust kind of administration control. User get to, before going to the profile, they will always be popped up with a credential uh, view and they have to provide the credential. The administrator can control multiple groups. They can create the session profile there itself and then deploy it or allowing only set of users to make changes into the toolbar. Okay, few users should not use macros because that is uh, nothing as per uh, the scope of work. So that kind of a robust administration, what if uh, we want to have it? And uh, how about the web browsers? It's very common, right? Uh, if if you have a web browser, you don't need to install everything. Uh, if if the application can be called inside the web browser, for example. And so at least your mobile, your laptop, those will be kind of very much light and necessary space will not be eaten uh, by installing one more application. So that could be one of the uh, thing which you would want to have as an opportunity. Now, uh, let's say we have an application, nice, but there is a Java over there. But now with Java, I do have an issue. I have to manage the patch level of it. I have to see that, okay, there's a security leak. So our Java should be totally upgraded. So whosoever using my emulator that is Java based, then the IT administrator has to look into and that ensure that the Java is kind of clean over there, right? So that dependency, if, if that's an external system, can that be removed or not? <clears throat> and we want to access it over tablet or mobile. Right, so everything is going into tablet at least uh, as a different size of the screen. So, uh, so we want to have it, and and that makes sense because on the go, then you will be able to access your critical applications uh, directly onto the emulators. Right, no, no stopping over there. So, how about these opportunities? And let's see and hear from Deepak that uh, how hard or hack PEE, the other product uh, which are into the emulator space, how do they help? to address all these kind of opportunities. Before I go, is there any question anybody has? Okay, thank you. Uh, Deepak, it's over to you. Yeah, thanks, Father. Just give me a minute, I'll share my screen.
Hope you all can see my screen. Okay. Oh yeah. So I'll start. Um, <clears throat> so like Badal mentioned, the technology keep uh, changing. The evolution in a technologies, and the same time, the applications also need to uh, 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 work with those, uh, uh, or maybe the uh, also need to be evaluate and change this uh, uh, the way it works. So the very one thing, uh, the first thing that Vadal mentioned that uh, uh, it is a Windows based, the Picom is a Windows based native application. And it is always challenge for an administrator to manage the session, right? Because if any, a single property need to change the session property, it need to be changed for all the users, which is a, I'm a big I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not too sure we're seeing your screen. What should be uh, shown? Oh, okay, give me a second. Uh, can you see it now? And can you IBM confirm? host on demand. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Fine. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So in mid nineties, like Epicom was in early ninety uh, eighties, uh, when it was uh, in an emulator for the Windows based. But then in mid nineties, uh, the technology revolution started. Like it is becoming a known Windows uh, platform was becoming a more. Uh, attraction getting more attractions also because of its are uh, those are the multi-threaded environment and also the secure at the same time right and also the java web application java web web based application is becoming popular because it is easy to admin it is easy to use those application over a browser yeah that is the time that uh, ibm uh, uh, started uh, evaluating the emulator which can be accessed over the web which is easy to admin and which is has a less dependency on a client. So till now it was a native application, but then it has to be a distributed application because of the technology's revolution. So IBM host on demand, uh, it filled all the technology gap, which was there between Epicom and the uh, technology environment. And also it is easy to maintain uh, for the admin to uh, do the administrators of the sessions, the users, all those things, right? So we'll see how uh, uh, IBM host on demand uh, covers those gaps, how it serves the emulator on a uh, web. So IBM host on demand, it is a platform independent. That means it supports a various uh, desktop client operating system. So till now the PCOM was only on a Windows, but then there was a time when the Unix system was getting a popular, then the uh, Mac system are getting uh, <clears throat> in a use, and the users wanted to access the emulator on those platforms as well, right? So IBM host on demand as support all those operating system. And IBM host on demand is basically a client server architecture. That means you have one server where you maintain all the sessions, users profiles. So for admin, it is easy to maintain those uh, sessions or the users because it's a single place that those changes need to be done. No need to push on each and every system. IBM host on demand also comes with a rich set of the uh, libraries, which uh, we call it a HACL, um, the host access class library. There is a set of the jars which provide an APIs where you can write your own applications or own Java applications to connect to the mainframe. And also it increased the ROI. That means if though it is a client server based architecture, you need a server, but it supports all, almost all the OS as a server. That means if you already have the IBM GOS or AS400, you can install the host on demand server there also. You need not to buy a separate server there. Right, so it is an increased on ROI. Uh, talking about the features, it is uh, uh, up to all the features uh, which is there. The PCOM was there, so uh, feature wise, it is as rich as the PCOM. Plus, it has some uh, enhanced or uh, advanced uh, features that uh, that is because of the Java or the web based uh, emulator. So, you know. Uh, uh, 
say in a uh, host on demand, it support a Java web start, a Java launcher. It also support the macros, uh, ELAP applications uh, for support, all those uh, uh, which is the emulators uh, features are there already there in a host on demand. Uh, moving to next slide, which is basically talks about how the host on demand works. So in a PCOM, it was a single native applications where all you get an EXE, you need to install on uh, your system, you need to configure the session and then you connect to the mainframe. But in case of the Java, we uh, make this as a client server. So you have one host on demand server uh, where you install the HOD and then all the configuration, either it's a users or your session profiles uh, that is configured on a HOD server. So once the HOD server is ready on your client machine, you connect to the HOD server through the web server. And initially the when the first time the client uh, connect to the HOD server, it download the session profiles in, and also uh, some client binaries that is in the form of the jars. And this is only the first time it gets downloaded. Once you have uh, the binaries and the session profile on your client machine within the uh, JRE runtime, with the JRE runtime, you can directly connect to your mainframe, right? So this is uh, the simple architecture, how the host on demand works. We have one server, we have a client. The first time the jars binaries get downloaded on a client, and then uh, it connect to your mainframe or a telnet. Now the advantage of this architecture is that first is it deep couple the server and the client component. That means uh, you need not to maintain uh, session profiles or uh, user profiles on each system. That means we'll do it on a centralized system. Anytime any changes need to be done, will be done on a server side. So the admin job become an easier, it is easy to maintain. So if any port number or a protocol or a uh, IP of the host chains, just need to change here. The next time the client access the session, those changes will be automatically downloaded on a client machine, right? Also, because it's a, a, a main component is a server, so it is easy to manage. You can do your service configurations, creation of the users, group, and any access control that you want to give to the users, whether they can change the property of a given uh, field or uh, <clears throat> security features, all can be managed on a HOD server. So it's a single point of a, a, a place where uh, changes can be done and then the later it will be reflected to all the users. So it's a centralized management. And the next one is that minimum requirement on a client machine is just a browser and a Java. So all this windows, we have a Microsoft <coughs> Internet Explorer in early days and now we, there are many other browsers. So uh, you just need a browser and a Java runtime to execute a client on a client machine. You need not to install anything. The first time when you do all the mm, client or the HOD client will be downloaded on your system. And then with the, with the Java runtime, it, your session will be launched, right? So this is the minimum requirement. Going to next, right? Now, uh, again, there's a time changes. Uh, there were some uh, technology revolutions again happens. There are technology changes was coming because the HOD, the initial when it was uh, being developed, it was based on a Java applet technologies, right? And the over like a, a later in a 2010 or later, uh, the Java applet are becoming a deprecated. The NLP and the web start also being uh, deprecated in a JDK 9. And also it's mentioned that it will be removed for the future release then the, how the HOD client will work, right? And also the user wanted to have the same experience. Even if you change something on a client side, the end user want to have the same uh, experience when they launch the session, when they start the session. So for this one, the we uh, the IBM host on demand come with the two solution. One is a HOD launcher. The HOD launcher uh, is an application 
that again helps to download the jar files there is the uh, one thing that we need to launch the hod client we need a jar file so with the hod launcher it helps downloading the jar files and launch the client application so uh, it doesn't need an applet or it is a no dependency on applet or a gnlp also <clears throat> all the clients which was there either it's a cache client or a download client or any other pages which was there with the hod server will work all will work with a hod launcher so for the end user uh, nothing get changed for the admin nothing get changed it is just a hod launcher uh, with a small configuration it takes care of everything so uh, uh, so being whenever the technology keep changing uh, the evolutions on the emulator keep happening right then also there was a challenge uh, one more uh, gap was there because uh, HOD needs a system JRE to run. And maybe in your systems, you have the other Java application, which also need a JRE. And a later point of time, there was a specific JRE because of the vulnerability, the application support a different set of the JRE. So you cannot have a two system JRE at the same time. So for to overcome this one, there's a one more uh, HOD client we call a managed hold which comes with its own JRE. It doesn't depend on a system JRE. So that means you need not to, or you can have a separate JRE or a system JRE for your other application. The managed hold will run with its own JRE. And <clears throat> it gets installed on your system and it supports all the client platform, being your Mac, being your Linux, or being your Windows. So uh, uh, this uh, our the dependency where you need to have a separate JRE for a HOD or for the other applications, right? Uh, moving to this, before moving to this, again, though we are talking about that somehow, or we are managing the Java application, but then there's a time came in a 2015 times when the uh, there was a, so much changes in a JRE was happening. Every now and days, there was a vulnerability in a JRE that that uh, admin need or that system mm, users need to change their JRE. So uh, that users or that uh, the users was needing some or they were looking for some solution which are Java independent. That means they don't need a Java to run the emulator. You and also because in actually we download some J jars or the session profiles only on a client machine but there was some uh, there was a uh, thoughts going on there is something like we don't need to download anything on a client machine and then we can run a emulator within the browser and that is where the hack pee extended edition comes in a picture it is a totally zero footprint uh, client and <clears throat> it doesn't download anything on your client machine and it doesn't need a Java to run the emulator. All it need a HTML5 compatible browser. So all the recent browser, the latest browser support the HTML5. So that means you can run your emulator within browser. You open the browser, hit the URL, your emulator will be launched. You close the browser, it vanishes. No footprint on your system. Nothing need to be downloaded, nothing need to be installed to run the emulator on your system. That is an uh, IBM HackP Extended Edition. To run the IBM HackP Extended Edition, you don't need to uh, install the server and all. It can reuse your session definitions, which is already configured for the host on demand. So that means the HackP EE can connect to your HOD server, read the session definitions, which is there, was already created for the HOD client and the users can see the uh, icons they can launch the sessions and then the sessions uh, it will connect to your mainframe or a as400 over the telnet uh, there's no dependency on a java it all runs within html5 compatible browser uh, there's no dependency on a java plugin so because uh, in a latest browser they remove the java plugin being as a security threat <laughs> Existing infrastructure, like I mentioned, 
it can read all your HOD servers, uh, <clears throat> HOD sessions definitions, which is there on a HOD server can be read. So you need not to redefine or reconfigure your users, your sessions, all those. So those can be read. It support uh, end to end uh, secure connection uh, from your <clears throat> client to the HTTP runtime. That is, we call it a HTTP server which connect to the HOD server to read the profile. So from client to HTTP server, it is a, a HTTP connection. So that can be HTTP or HTTPS. And from your once you start the connection, the connection goes from a HTTP, uh, sorry, the HTTP server to uh, uh, your mainframe. So there is a telnet. So it support the telnet TLS also. Mm. Uh, uh, being in a web, uh, uh, application is it's a, a, a user centric and a intuitive design it supports uh, recently with that latest version is support uh, uh, office 365 where you can uh, green screen data can be <coughs> uh, uh, automatically copied and pasted uh, to the excel also it comes with uh, its own debug module being in a uh, if uh, there is any issues and all uh, 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 easily the log can be captured and can be shared for the investigation purpose. It also support like uh, uh, TLS 1.3 and uh, macros and other session manager APIs. Because it's a, a web-based application, it support all the latest browser, which has the HTML5 compatible. Uh, also, it can run in a small devices. That means in your tablet, in your other uh, small devices, the emulator can be accessed, which is also becoming a, a, a new uh, expectations from the emulator there you want to access the emulator in a small devices. So HTEE can be accessed uh, within the small devices as well. Uh, moving next, uh, because uh, 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 now that is, uh, um, the applications need to be uh, on a high availability environment where that system or the uh, one server goes down, there's no uh, downtown for the users. For that, the uh, HPEE can be deployed in a high availability environment. Because it's deployed on an application server, there's a load balancer can sit and can distribute the load among the application server. And then the application can uh, application server connect to the HOD server where we have all our definitions uh, uh, stored or the configuration being stored. Once those <clears throat> configurations is being read and the icon is being shown to the end user, the connections as usually goes from your application server to the <clears throat> productions or the non-production server, how it is. It also comes with the license management uh, um, uh, tool, which uh, give a, a real time statics of the how many users has been connected uh, from which machine it is being uh, connected so all this informations that license manager captured the real time users of the emulator now uh, this is all before we go i can give a quick demos about the hp how easy it is easy to access the emulators on a browser with the like PEE. So I'll just access one URL. And we'll uh, see where it is. So we already have a demo server from there I will access. So all the server, uh, the actually server configurations, everything is done. Uh, session profiles is already generated. So your end user will simply launch a browser and click on a URL, which is configured by the admin. And this is how the user will see. Nothing gets downloaded on their system. Uh, no need to have any Java dependency and the user can simply start the session. And session will come within the browser. It supports all the macros, it supports all the said, manager, API, keyboard, color remap, all those things is being supported in a happy EE. And within the sessions, they can navigate it. Right. 
so this is a, a, a quick uh, say a quick demo for a hack pee which has all the session properties is being defined and a user can simply go and change if admin allowed any property to be changed so these are the session properties where the users can modify those properties provided that admin has given a privilege or access for users to modify those properties so with this one uh, i'll pass uh, the control to the badal again to uh, talk about the emulator future strategy badal over to you yeah thank you deepak I'm sharing uh, the emulator future strategy slide. I hope it's visible to everyone. So thank till you. now, we, yeah, thank you. So till now we talked about the different kind of emulators we have. Uh, one is Windows based, one is Java based, and then the third one, the Hack PE, which we just saw right now, zero footprint and directly accessible onto the browser. Right. Uh, so there are so many challenges or the opportunities, I would say, those has been till now been exploited into the emulator. And uh, for example, PCOM coming into Azure, right? Uh, and then for the HackP, what we have it, uh, which can be open into different, different kinds of devices within the browser space. So, so many opportunities are there uh, right now in front of us and all those, these emulators are able to cater to. But what next could be, or, or what probably the other big thing, what we are seeing, most of our end users are trying to achieve uh, into their IT space. <clears throat> and that's the same as something which they want emulator also to have a look and if the emulator actually can adapt to those kind of strategy. I think everybody will be aware of it, right? The cloud deployment, uh, that, that's been the talk of town uh, since the cloud is there, right? So every, application nowadays what we see is count kind of into the cloud uh, being deployed accessible to everywhere making use of the cloud platform and right now to precise we are not talking about mainframes lift and shift that's a different topic at all and uh, myself also as a mainframe uh, person understand what challenges somebody will have when they try to move the whole mainframe to cloud so that's a different task and that's a very huge ask uh, to be done but anyway over here we are talking about uh, the emulator uh, that's an application which we use to access our mainframes or es400 kind of applications right but that's what uh, the team or the it team or the pro team has been looking mostly uh, to move their applications to cloud. And that's where what the emulator actually, or what emulator can do it, that's we will try to look into. A few online st studies actually has uh, talked about some 70% of the companies, they have actually, they have been increasing the budgets so that uh, they can adopt uh, to this cloud technology. And, and the reasons are multiple actually, it's not just uh, for a few things, but very valid reasons also I would say, they want to have it first is high availability. <clears throat> So individual applications should be always available to everybody, right? Because now there is browser, we talk, we have seen how hard and hack PE seamlessly can be called upon over the browser or the hack P for example, can be seen uh, within the browser space in itself. So when it is in distributed architecture, we want it to be always available. And the cloud platform does provide, uh, there are a lot of things within cloud, which allows to have the backup, right? Which allows you to have multiple systems running in chunks. And so that if one fails, another can make use of it. So that is the high availability uh, we are looking for. And mainframe always consists of the mission critical application. So whenever we are accessing them, we want that access to be 24 by seven. Then uh, now, most of the <laughs> sorry, most of the applications in in your uh, company, for example, goes into cloud. So, which means the access to those applications, also the authentication happening up, that also has to be common. And in cloud, there is a concept of Open ID, which makes use of Auth 2.0, kind of uh, the protocol identity protocol. And these kind of uh, the YDC based authentications are very much seamlessly adaptable into AWS or into Azure or into the Google Cloud. So uh, companies now want to have uh, such kind of identification or the authentication to happen sitting into seamlessly in most of the applications which are going into the cloud. The other is the reason is consistency, right? So if 
most of the applications are going the expectation is that all the applications should go whichever can be done so so that's a consistency they want to have it so that they are not spreading their uh, their task everywhere uh, so that they are able to focus and that is something they want to focus into cloud and everything onto that infrastructure then the innovation and innovation is an obvious thing that it always drive the business if we stop doing innovation probably that ROI which we are looking for that will totally dried up, right? And cloud computing, uh, whether we are just talking about the hybrid uh, private or the public cloud, right? That enables um, organizations, our users to be far more agile uh, and also while it is in the IT cost and the operational expenses, right? Making use of so many things which cloud has, the high availability which we just talked about, that's one of the major things into there. So next question is that, uh, how actually emulators can fit into these kind of a strategy right so so let's see um, what what's in the future uh, for the emulator which we can actually think of right we just saw actually uh, previously with the pcom that now uh, we are making it available into the azure desktop so that is a one step uh, towards going into cloud so you have the Azure desktop, which is accessible over the Azure cloud. Now you open the desktop. If PCOM has been enabled there by your IT team, then the PCOM as an app will be available everybody uh, who are using making use of that Azure cloud. <clears throat> that's that's one of the thing which has a step has been put forward um, for our Windows based uh, emulator. Now now the other emulators also will be making uh, will become part of it slowly uh, let's see when it does but the future uh, is there right uh, and let's see actually if the possibility exists or not so we are not talking about uh, committing anything that this thing exists but let's see if emulator can even become uh, kind of more cloud native or not and if then what kind of uh, opportunities lies over there with it Right. So one thing is for sure that, uh, again, we're talking about mainframe because the persistent connection with the mainframe is required. So it sits on the cloud. It doesn't sit on the cloud. It's in private premise or on premise. It is, it doesn't matter. Emulator just need a connection uh, out of it. And majorly into cloud, you will have uh, applications deployed in containers. So it's a, it's a very common uh, kind of an cloud deployment for any application, which would look right. So you will have different uh, pods running in Kubernetes and all those pods will have either that application server into it and then running up that application and accessible to anybody. One pod goes down, the another will be taking that load or the load balancing will be internally taken by that cloud infrastructure itself or your service provider, for example, Azure, where you use or you make use of AWS. So all those uh, platform or the frameworks give you that uh, kind of extensive uh, availability of the applications. Now, how emulator can be? We need to understand that to make it cloud native, the decoupling of the component has to happen. Right? If we are able to decouple it, then therein, if we can create some microservice out of it, some web service out of it. HackPE has its own uh, session APIs, which allow you to open up that session, communicate with it, like just similar to what Hackl LAP is. It also has its own JavaScript-based API. So what if we can make use of those as a web service? Uh, those are possible or those makes more sense into the cloud space when all those has been divided into different different containers right and uh, or they has been split into different, different components so which when we have component then we can have it into containers and then the kubernetes sorry my bad uh, the kubernetes can come into picture <coughs> or the other deployment method into the cloud and then via client uh, there'll be an office API gateway you can access uh, the emulator uh, over there, different components of the emulator will be talking to each other and eventually connecting to our mainframe, getting the data and displaying it into our end system. Now that could be Azure desktop, that could be our regular browser within the connected to the cloud and then downloading that emulator from there. So those kind of uh, aspects uh, which has to be looked into or which will be probably looked into that will help our emulators to go into cloud or become cloud native kind of an application. Now coming to hard and happy EE, because these are the applications which are very much stable into the distributed architecture as of now. So how actually we can uh, or we can think of these applications being a cloud native. Now HackP server, so so you we talked about uh, when we are seeing the HackP, right? So in the high level diagram, you would have seen a HackP server is there. That's nothing but an application server, which is running that HackP binary, right? That uh, EER project of it. And then we have a license manager. So license manager uh, helps for our whole, whole HackP package in itself, tells us that how many usage is there. So it gives all the graphical information out of it. 
and then the hot server. So license server and hack you server anyway are different, uh, means different componentized. But hot server currently is packaged with a lot of things. And, and similarly in your space of the ability to what you're using, uh, similar to hot server, it could be something like that. And, and can those uh, servers be again componentized so that they becomes cloud native? Yes, the opportunity is there. And um, for example, in hot server, we have many things right now, which is very much couple. For example, admin utility, uh, which allows actually the administrator. It's for the administrator task. Then we have the redirector, uh, which sits in front of your mainframe so that the user don't know which IP address is connecting to the end IP address, then the authentication framework of it and the deployment wizard. Deployment wizard is all about uh, creating the HTML pages, the session profiles and everything, right? So, so these components does sit. The opportunity is there, the availability is there to decouple uh, these things into the hot server. And then uh, when it's done, then probably it will be kind of uh, either a pure or a kind of an hybrid uh, cloud deployment, uh, which as of now I can think of. So uh, that's all about this future strategy and how emulator like HOT or, or HackP or like anything else actually and sits easily uh, into the uh, cloud space. So the opportunities are huge, right? Because these emulators uh, provide that scope uh, to break itself into the different different components. And as we are trying to uh, unleash the emulator capabilities for changing uh, with the challenging or the changing IT landscape and the requirements we see, actually the more opportunities within our emulator itself for example, we have been developing and changing it a lot. Like in PCOM, we have seen now it becomes the online session managers there, right? So all these seems very much capable enough to adopt to all these uh, kind of the changing requirements which coming from our customers or are in very much high demand. With that, uh, we come to our uh, end of this presentation. Thank you, everyone. Uh, if there is any question, we can have it. Okay, so I have um, allowed uh, participants to unmute themselves. So if you have uh, any specific questions or if you just like to have a conversation with the uh, speakers, that's uh, is that something you can do now? That would be fine. Uh, and if not, if you are planning on leaving now, this was session 3F, please leave your feedback. Thank you. I don't see anybody unmuting themselves. There were some questions in the chat uh, that everybody could see, I'm fairly sure. Um, but uh, um, they were all answered at the time, so. Okay, if no one has any uh, questions they'd like to ask, then uh, thank you both for uh, your presentation, interesting, and um, hope to see a lot of you at the next session or another session. Okay, yep. thank you very thank much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Anna. Thank you everyone. Have a nice day, bye.